Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for the Ask Historians 2021 Digital Conference keynote address. My name is Morgan Lewin, and I am this year's AHDC Diversity and Inclusion Chair. The theme of our 2021 conference is centered around the ways in which the past has been deliberately or accidentally misrepresented in order to serve the interests of white male hegemony to the detriment and marginalization of women, LGBTQIA individuals, the disabled, and communities of color. In recognition of this, I would like to begin this session by acknowledging that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our conference program or on our website. It will also be provided in the video description of this presentation once the recording is made available. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Devon Miesua, an enrolled citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Cora Lee Beers Price Professor in the Humanities Program at the University of Kansas. Dr. Miesua is an historian by training and the former editor of the American Indian Quarter. She is also the author of numerous award-winning books on indigenous history and current issues, including Ned Christie, The Creation of an Outlaw and Cherokee Hero, Choctaw Crime and Punishment, 1884 to 1907, American Indigenous Women, Decolonization, Empowerment, Activism, Hatak Witches, and the forthcoming Bands of the Return. She will be joined by Ask Historians moderator Kyle Pittman, an Espers and Yakima descendant, as respondent and moderator of this presentation. As I pass the metaphorical microphone over to Kyle and Dr. Miesua, allow me to welcome you all once more. And in the language of my ancestors, the Gununa Kune, I thank you. Miach Chi Chaka. Thank you very much for the introduction to our conference and our guest for this keynote address, Morgan. In 1887, Cherokee Ned Christie was accused of murdering a U.S. Deputy Marshal in the former Indian Territory, now modern-day Oklahoma. Despite the lack of evidence, numerous fake news stories were printed about the alleged murder. Christie would later meet his end at the hands of U.S. Marshals in 1892, but not before his character was sensationalized, morphing him into a career criminal outlaw, effectively ass assassinating his image. The story of Ned Christie, a Cherokee politician, blacksmith, homeowner, and ultimately a victim of injustice, it demonstrates the insidious nature of fake news and how the common tales of the American Wild West have more than one side to their retellings. As we settle into this virtual space, let us be prepared to hear Dr. Devin Mahisua on her presentation titled, Ned Christie and the Consequences of Fake News. Dr. Mahisua. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and I have to apologize, yesterday the uh, internet went out in my small town. Uh, usually we're plagued by uh, squirrels getting into the transformers and we lose electricity, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, here we are today. This is really near and dear to my heart. I would say that as the years have gone by since I even started working on this, you know, I have just become you know, even more convinced of the utter injustice that was done, not just to Ned, but um, also to uh, some of his family members. So Ned Christie, as we know him, his name is actually Ned Wade, and Wade was his father, um, so it means Ned, son of Watt. He was born in 1852, and this is the front and back covers of the Chronicles of Oklahoma. I had an article about Ned come out before the book did, and I, so I was really pleased. I thought they did a, a nice job with these uh, great pictures of him. Ned was a Katua a Katua Cherokee. Uh, he was a traditionalist, and that means that he adhered to ceremonies, he spoke Cherokee, he preferred to live away from intermarried whites. In 1887, U.S. Uh, Deputy Marshal Dan Maples traveled from Fort Smith, Arkansas to Tahlequah, and it was here that Dan Maples, in the cover of darkness, was shot several times and killed, 
and ultimately the blame fell on Ned Christie. And for the next five years of his life, Ned you know, was trying to evade capture until he was killed in 1892. So that's that's the story. No, okay, we'll keep going. So this is this is where things took place. Uh, this is the state of Oklahoma, became the state in 1907. And you can see over here um, on the right hand side, Tahlequah, which is the capital of the Cherokee Nation. And so it is it is still there. And this is where Maples was killed. The story of Ned Christie is very compelling because it encompasses a lot of topics that people who are aficionados of Wild West stories really like. Images of the forbidding wilderness, masculinity, patriotism, righteousness. Women are included, but usually to bolster the masculine narrative. Lots of shootings and stabbings, dynamite, whiskey drinking, beheadings, tar and featherings. And so all of these elements show up in the, in the Christie saga. Christie, you know, this story is also a story of good triumphing over evil. But the question is, who is good and who is evil? And it all depends on who's the author of the headline. Ned Christie and what happened to him is a prime example of the consequences of fake news. That is the creation of headlines and sensationalist stories uh, to sell copies. And that's what all this was about, money-making venture. So I started uh, you know, this you know, interest in Ned Christie a very long time ago, actually when I was in elementary school. But when I um, started doing research for my book, Choctaw Crime and Punishment, this came out in 19, um, let's see, when, 2010 rather. Um, this is in part the story of the murder of my great great grandfather, who was a Choctaw light horseman, and he was sheriff of the Sugarloaf County in uh, Mushalatobi District in the Choctaw Nation. And so he was murdered by some rival uh, uh, political factions. And when I was doing research for this book, when I was looking at hundreds of newspaper articles, in the same story that mentioned my ancestor, there were uh, mentions of Ned Christie. So there was a lot of overlap between the two. And so while I was collecting data for this book, I thought, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and start piling up things about Ned because there was just so much. So that this is where my formal um, interest, I guess, started. So once again, here's Tahlequah, capital of the Cherokee Nation. And Ned Christie lived in a small little area called Wahalo, and it is still there in the Cherokee Nation. You can, you can go, and it's approximately 30 miles if you follow you know, the highway. Back then, however, Ned would take a direct route on horseback, and so it would maybe about 20 miles. So he would just cut right through the woods. You know, when people uh, think about Indian territory during this time period, they think of teepees maybe. Um, they don't think perhaps that the Cherokee Nation could be quite sophisticated. So in 1887, by the time that Dan Maples got there, they had a beautiful Supreme Court building, hotels, uh, grist and flour mill, drugstore, post office, ice factory, electric plant, lots and lots of lawyers and physician offices. Staper and Sons was the biggest store there. And these are citizens of the Cherokee Nation, by the way, um, that are standing in there. And so Staplers and Sons does play a role in this story. But I wanted to just kind of give you a, a sort of an image of what Tahlequah was looking like at that time period. There also was a Cherokee female seminary. I wrote my first book, The Cherokee Female Seminary, and all of these ladies that are standing there, this was taken around 1889, these are all Cherokee women. So there was a faction of the Cherokee Nation who were highly acculturated and, and um, also quite, let's see, their blood quantum, I guess, would be very low. There were some women in the um, 1850s whose blood quantum was like 100, 1, 128 degree Cherokee blood. So when you, when you look at that down to today, you've got some members of the Cherokee Nation that are like one 5,000 something degree Cherokee blood. But the Cherokee Female Seminary also plays a role in this. And this is the huge uh, second building back there. And these women were studying French, chemistry, Shakespeare, and uh, physics. But getting back to Ned Christie, in 1885, Ned, despite the reality that he uh, was a traditionalist, he also was highly concerned about what was happening to not just the Cherokee Nation, but also the other tribal nations, because there was a lot of encroachment going on. People coming into tribal lands, taking their resources, wanting to intermarry, usually with the women. So in 1885, he was elected to the National Council under Chief Dennis Bushyhead. 
And he too was a nationalist. He was also uh, somebody who very much was a champion of the traditionalists, the full bloods, uh, the people who were not interested in Christianity or, or uh, speaking English or even um, intermarrying. This is the National Council House and it is there today. If you wanted to go to Tahlequah out, there it is. But this is pretty much what it looked like back then. And Ned had a lot of responsibilities. Um, he could read and write in English. Um, he was doing everything from looking at sheriff's reports, amending and repealing acts and laws, creating laws. Um, he was very concerned about protecting trees and resources because in the middle of the night, uh, people would come in and cut down the trees and put them in the Illinois River. And so when you woke up the next morning, the trees were gone. He also was very concerned about the number of men who wanted to marry Cherokee women. So these white men would come into the nation. And if you wanted to marry a Cherokee woman, you had to present three letters of good character and give five dollars. And then you would be assessed and given permission or not. He also got to look at the number of applications of people who wanted citizenship in the Cherokee Nation. So he was constantly busy and he, he, was, he was very frustrated by, by a lot of this. This is a Cherokee syllabary. And if any of you are interested, you can look at the constitution and laws of the Cherokee Nation. They are in a bound volume and it is written in the Cherokee syllabary. And these are some of the laws. This is during the time period that Ned was on the council. So this could have been something that Ned actually wrote. And again, here's a syllabary that was created in 1822 by Sequoia or uh, George Guess. And just very quickly, he isolated all the syllables in the Cherokee language, and then he created a symbol to go with every syllable. So if you knew how to speak your language and could memorize these symbols, then supposedly overnight you could you could write in uh, Cherokee. So once again, getting back here to Dan Maples in 1887, he had come to Tahlequah because he actually was going turkey hunting and fishing <clears throat> because this was an area that was really lush, a lot of water, a lot of game. So he came with his son and some friends of his. And these men, these, this, these are the posses that actually killed Ned in 1892. But this gives you an idea of what these U.S. deputy marshals look like. And so Dan Maples was, was one of these people. But of course, at this time period, nobody was looking for Ned because he hadn't done anything. So he came from Fort Smith, Arkansas, and you can go visit uh, the Fort Smith um, historic site. And laws were very complicated back then. And, and so anybody who committed a crime in Indian territory, if you were an Indian, you committed a crime against another Indian, you were tried in tribal court. If you were a Indian who killed a white man or woman, you were tried at the US District Court for the Western District of Arkansas. And so this is, this is where this is. And to give you an idea, there's Fort Smith, Arkansas down here, and then Wahello, from where uh, Ned lived, um, it would probably be about 50 miles. And so um, apparently um, Dan Maples, he had traveled maybe 70 miles from Fort Smith to, to uh, Tahlequah to go hunting and fishing. Well, it turns out that in Tahlequah that day, not only had Ned just got finished with a very long and exhausting um, tribal council meeting, there were some men there in town who I would call bad company. In fact, that's the title of the chapter. John Paris, Charlie Bobtail, Looney Coon, uh, Steve Van, John Hogshooter, and Bub Trainer. We don't have pictures of them, but I did find Bub's uh, signature. All of these men were Cherokees and all of them had very long uh, rap sheets, we'll call it. Um, and uh, the Fort Smith, Arkansas knew him, knew all these guys very well. They had been to Fort Smith multiple times. So what happened? What happened to Dan Maples? So again, here's the Cherokee Female Seminary. This is what it looks like today. If you were looking out the windows across the street of what is, this is called Centennial Plaza now, you'll see a little, little creek right there. And then there is a wall underneath that building, underneath those windows. And there used to be a plaque that said, you know, on this spot in 1887 was where U.S. Deputy Marshal Dan Maples was, was shot and killed. Somebody stole that in the 1970s, so it's not there anymore. And of course, during that time period, those buildings were not there, and this was a spring, and there were a lot more trees. So Maples, 
had gone to, oh, I want to point this out because it's kind of funny. There is a place um, on that street, which is Muskogee Avenue, called Salmonella's, which is a wonderful place to eat. So when I was there visiting some of uh, Ned's descendants and talking, I went to Salmonella's. Yes, it's a great place for, a, for an omelet. Okay, so it was under the cover of darkness, and Dan Maples had gone to Stapler and Sons to pick up some eggs and some other sundries across a log to take him to his campsite over that spring. And as he was crossing over that log with a friend of his, shots rang out and he was shot several times in the chest. And he ended up dying um, not long after, but it was very dark and nobody could see who did it. And so that's very important to remember. Well, word, word got out that those five men were um, in town. So Isaac Parker, who was the judge at Fort Smith at that time, he wrote indictments. He had indictments set up for those five men. Oh, and by the way, this is the scaffold, which is at Fort Smith. And you can walk right up to this scaffold. You can't go up there, but you can stand there and, and um, touch it, I guess. And the man who, who uh, one of the men who murdered my ancestors was, was hanged here in 1889. So these indictments were written for these men. And they all pointed fingers at each other. They were all saying, he did it. I didn't do it. He did it. Nobody said that Christie killed Maples, but they did mention that Ned Christie was in town. So Judge Parker became very interested in this. He said, I want to see Ned Christie. So he wrote an indictment for Ned simply because he wanted information out of him. Ned wouldn't go. He refused to go because he did not trust the federal government at all. His family, and this is his father, Watt, um, Wade, and then the man on the right is Lacey, his grandfather. These men had been across the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, and Lacey's wife had died on the trail. So Ned had nothing whatsoever to do with the government because he was absolutely convinced that they were going to arrest him and hang him, even though he didn't do anything. And that was probably a big mistake, you know, in retrospect. He probably should have gone to defend himself. And this is another picture of Ned and his uh, brother James. This is a really nice picture. So, so again, Ned grew up hearing stories, and this is for your quiz later, right? Um, it's, it's here that the Christie family um, was from this little area right there by in North Carolina, and then they were removed, and then they came over to um, Indian Territory. So again, I want to point out that Ned was very anti-immigration. He very much knew that his family was against that, uh, the removal. He also didn't like people coming into the nation. He was a traditionalist. He believed in uh, preserving his ceremonies, speaking Cherokee as much as he could. He did not really approve of intermarriage with anybody who, who was not Cherokee. He wasn't necessarily anti-Christian, but he just did not particularly appreciate some of the things that, that some of these people were doing. So he was also, therefore, a nationalist, which is different from a progressive. And so this caused intertribal factionalism between the nationalists and the progressives. The progressives were acquisitive. They were interested in acquiring wealth. And so a lot of their children attended the uh, Cherokee seminaries, okay? So they did look very, very acculturated. The progressives did absolutely nothing to defend Ned at all. Ned, now, because he did not go to Fort Smith, everybody is pointing the finger at Ned saying, okay, then he did it. Because he didn't come in to defend himself, he must have done it. So for the next five years of Ned's life, he has to deal with posses coming to his property, trying to capture him. Every time a posse came to his house, he would open his, you know, the, the little window and he would shoot and he would always wound somebody. And so this really didn't help his reputation. But finally, in November 1892, a large posse did come to his house. Um, it, this was a second house that he had to build because the first one burned down and it was made of heavy duty logs. And so they ultimately blew it up with dynamite. And so as the house has caught fire, he runs out the front door, kind of like um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They shoot him as he's flying out the front door. And so that, that was the end of Ned. There were not a whole lot of stories about Ned Christie prior to 1892. There were some newspaper stories, but it, they really didn't take off until the day he died. And once Ned did die, oh boy, these stories came right and left. 
Here's an example of one of the very few that did come out prior to his death, where they're calling him a bad Indian, perhaps as desperate a man or black as ever produced in any country. So these things are gonna get even more dramatic and over the top. These are just a few examples because I found hundreds upon hundreds of them. The most sought after man that ever lived in the territory, he's notorious outlaw, desperado, reckless, surly. Um, he had a deadly hatred for deputy marshals. So where did all these stories come from? They were coming from Massachusetts, Iowa, California, Washington, DC, and these newspaper men, they would get a wire um, of a little story that may have come out of Indian Territory, the Cherokee Nation, and they would take one look at that story and say, aha, well, this is something interesting. And then they would just put their own spin on it. They would put their own headline on it, even though they really didn't know anything. So this is why we have so many stories from around the country. This one, this is a doozy, you know, a man who had fought a greater number of, you know, than any and anybody known to civilization. And this was a daily Oklahoma in 1906. So as years went by, as time went by, these stories got even more dramatic. These stories didn't just come out in newspapers. They also came out in books. So in rot gut rustlers, here we've got him cold blooded and ruthless, a born killer, etc. For many, many years, for many decades, almost 100 years, that is, Ned is just seen as truly just one of the worst outlaws, you know, that the West has ever created. Not only did they create um, crazy stories, they also came up with random numbers about how many people that he killed. So it's kind of a you can just look at any of these newspapers and see, you know, it ranges from one marshal to, you know, three Indians and three deputies to six, you know, four express messengers, you know, 10 men. And then they start expanding it to women, 14 men, women and children. So basically you get the idea of, of what these newspaper people are doing. And almost uh, press, I was really shocked to discover that in Oklahoma, they're still saying the same thing. Um, so this, this ended up in the Edmund Life and Leisure, um, where Dave Ferris wrote that he was an outlaw, that he was credited with killing all of these people. And so the story you know, also had a lot of other exaggerations in there. So these consequences of untruths, you know, what are the untruths? So what we have going on here obviously is fake news, but it is character assassination, libel and slander. But unfortunately it's during this time period that this was going on to a lot of native people. The stories about say uh, Geronimo, Crazy Horse, you know, all across our country, native people can't do anything about this. There's nothing that they can do about what is being written or said about them. I have Wilma Mankiller down here because one time Wilma had said, you really can't argue with people in public. Don't ever do that because they don't know who the idiot is. So I thought, you know, that kind of fits in here because, you know, if Native people were to speak up, who are they really going to believe? There are many reasons it was so devastating, but one reason is that Ned had a big family. And so this is just some of my early notes about it. But Ned, he was married multiple times. He had, he had many kids, but he had a lot of brothers and sisters. He had a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles. All of these people had to survive with Ned's reputation. So after Ned died and all these stories came out, the people who survived him were still having to face all of this. So it wasn't that it just impacted one person. This was like, you know, throwing the rock in the water. You know, it just spread out. Those ripples just affect a lot of people. And so just for grins, I thought I would show this. I borrowed my daughter's chalkboard because I was going to make the family tree. And then it just got so complicated. I needed two or three cork boards. So I kind of gave up. But so why did this happen? Post Civil War Indian Territory was incredibly violent. There were thousands of white intruders coming onto tribal lands, hundreds of murders, thefts, rapes, cases of whiskey selling every year, every day, you know, every week. There were so many white men coming in to marry Indian women that the tribe simply could not keep up with this. Railroads were starting to crisscross the nations, mining resource depletion, the plants and animals are disappearing, the, the waterways are changing. So this is prime, 
prime uh, background for outlaws. This is Cherokee Bill, and this is a big old picture that is up on the wall um, at Fort Smith, Arkansas. So there are a lot of crazy stories told about Bill, Bill Starr, Sam Starr, one of her husbands. True Grit, that was written by Charles Portis, actually takes, takes place in post-Civil um, War Choctaw Nation. Honestly, if you take a look at both of those movie characters that are in both versions, um, that's not too far off base. Those people were violent. So this is where Ned's house was, where that cow was standing right there. But of course, these are power lines. So again, Ned's house was destroyed. It was blown up by dynamite when he was killed. But just want to give you an idea. This is where he lived. And this house probably looked a lot like Ned's first house. This uh, belongs to one of the Christie's and it's about to fall down. But if you go to the Wahalo area, um, you see lots, lots of these houses that are starting to just about fall down. So Ned was married multiple times. The, the last woman that he married, her name was Nusi, um, also known as Nancy. So he ended up surviving Ned, but I'll tell you about her in a minute. But this is down the hill where Ned lived is a spring. And the picture on the right is still there. You can go and put your hands in that spring and that is where Nusi would get. And, that, and the creek is still there where those cows are. This is the Wahala uh, trading post where Ned and Nusi would go and to get their stuff. And that is my car parked right there because behind this trading post, is the Watt Christie Cemetery. And this is Ned. Um, and so this headstone had been missing for about 20 years. You see there's a big crack right across the middle of it. Well, somebody had stolen it and they had been using it as a tabletop for years. And then I guess when they got tired of it, they ended up dumping it by Sam and Ella's and somebody picked it up, put it back together and then brought it back to the cemetery. So during this time that Ned is being chased around, uh, he was still goofing around. <laughs> You know, he would stop, you know, he would go to the ends and making a playful photograph. I mean, Ned did a few things that, that I think may have been a bit questionable, but here, I guess he felt relaxed enough to do this. But getting back to, to these Wild West stories, um, these, these stories in Indian Territory just came fast and furiously. Here we got Zeke Proctor, Bill Pigeon, Most Miller, Henry Starr. And all of these guys had some really crazy stories told about them that were totally untrue. Billy the Kid, um, he wasn't really you know, right there amid all of these people, but just think about how many stories we've heard about Billy the Kid based on relatively little information. And there is a Billy the Kid ballet, which is why I have um, put this picture up here. If you really want to see some interesting pictures, Google that. There's a lot more. There also is a Ned Christie ballet, by the way. So again, time uh, raids you know, came to his property to try to catch him. He managed to shoot a dead. And so this is what in part gave him the reputation that he had. Ned had this picture uh, taken in 1811. It was less than a year after Dan Maples was killed. And I don't really know why he decided to do something like this, but he did. And this is the iconic picture of Ned where he's got his rifle on the chair, and uh, there's some interesting, more interesting tidbits about this, but we don't see this picture until after Ned has died. It was after Ned's death um, that this picture really is distributed far and wide. And in fact, when his house was burning down, one of the deputy marshals ran inside and found this picture on, this, on um, the, the table next to Ned and Nancy's bed. And so he took the picture, put it in his pocket, took it home with him. And that, this is how we, we know about this, this picture. So again, here are some sensationalistic pictures. This is Ned after he was shot and killed. They tied him on to the door and they brought him to Fort Smith where he lay there for three days in, a, in the back of a wagon and then they propped him up. Um, so picture, people could come and walk and take pictures of him. That is somebody stole the rifle. Um, somebody put that in his hands. And, and the re rationale for that was um, out, every dead outlaw needs to have a rifle in his hands when he has his picture taken. And then there's been some other 
pictures uh, that were drawn. And I was trying to figure out what to even call my book. Now, in retrospect, I wish I had just called it Ned Christie because I do not believe that he was an outlaw, but I did try to tell the story of how he was created, you know, to appear to be an outlaw, but he definitely was a Cherokee hero. So ultimately we settled on the, on the one on the left. So these tall tales, these are usually told by those who won or those who wish they had been part of the action. And many of the stories that we get about Ned that are so ridiculous come from the lawmen who either were a part of the posse or they had encountered Ned at some point. And they granted interviews to these newspapers. And basically the reason they were doing this was to create their own personal folklore. So this added to the creation of their mythology. And so it's almost as if the last person standing is the one who gets to create the story because if he's still alive and he can tell that story, then it must be true. So here's an example of, of uh, just one of the headlines. You know, somebody went to a great deal of trouble to, to create this, you know, see how nice and, and symmetrical it all is. But again, it's all to create um, interest so people will buy it. Peyton Tolbert was one of the men um, who went after Ned and was there at his death. And the Bowden brothers over here, the, one of the Bowdens, he was the last lawman to, to die. And he would tell crazy stories. He said, oh yeah, Ned shot me. He shot me twice. And of course he didn't, but who's gonna, who's gonna refute that because he's the last one standing. Iron Men by C.H. McKinnon. Okay, this is where a lot of the stories about Ned, um, this, is, this is where they come from right here. This guy had a very vivid imagination. And it is McKinnon who is the one who tells us that Ned was at least 6'5 and probably taller than that. He was a huge hulking, you know, maniacal outlaw. And the reason for this is that, and the reason they have to be this way is because that makes those who kill them appear to be more masculine. And in the 1890s, the male ideal among the middle class was that the men were muscular and rugged. And this is, this is when we see football and boxing really become expressions of manliness and aggressiveness, you know, masculinity. And so the Westerns, of course, um, you know, the ever popular Tombstone, you know, which is a really good movie, you know, mustaches, you know, I guess played a big part of this. But all of these people, you know, in Tombstone, they're all very distinctive. Um, there's Kurt Russell again, simply because I, I like him, but his mustache is, is pretty cool. There he is again in a bone tomahawk. If you like Westerns, you might want to check this one out. It's very strange. But anyway, so the epitome of, you know, the Wild West masculinity was John in the 1950s. And it just so happens, uh, this is the heyday of stories about Ned Christie as well. And John Wayne really was 6'4", something like that. And then here are some real icons, you know, of, of Western, Western movies, you know, Clint Eastwood and Lee, Lee Van Cleef, The Rifleman, Jack Palance, let's see, Ben Johnson, Warren Oates. Ernest Borgnine, uh, Bill Holden, I think, and the Wild Bunch, you know, rugged men, really integral to Western lore. And it's pretty obvious that, you know, outlaw Josie Wales, you know, Clint Eastwood really liked this picture of Ned. <laughs> it seems, seems uh, that may be where he got that idea. But yeah, so Ned has really had a lot of influence you know, on these, on these Westerns. Will Sampson, you know, the late um, Muscogee Creek actor was set to play Ned in 19, in, I think it was 1975. Uh, they were gonna make a movie about Ned. And then um, I think it was Ben Johnson was going to play Sheriff Yeos, who was the one who organized um, Ned's death. But the movie didn't happen. Um, Will Sampson passed away. And so they never did make the movie. So I wanted to find out just how tall was, just how tall was Ned. Okay. So again, that rifle is not Ned's. That, that belongs to somebody else. But I found out from a friend who works at Fort Smith that that particular rifle is 43 inches in length. Ned carried a Western uh, Winchester Centerfire 44, model 1873 uh, saddle ring carbine. But we don't know where that is. That has since disappeared, as have um, his pistols. 
After his death, somebody commented that he was about five feet seven and maybe 140 pounds. And for a little guy, he sure raised a lot of hell. So taking this picture again, I thought, I'm gonna figure out how tall he is. So I took the length of that rifle and then took that out and then was trying to figure out, okay, so how many inches might he be? Then I combined it with this photograph, but this isn't a full body photograph. And, and so for most people, we can figure out your height. Um, the inseam is 45% of your height. <laughs> So I got the, the length of the rifle he's holding, which is 38 inches, and then I figured out where his knees were. And to make a long story short, I figured out that he might have been about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, and a mathematician friend helped me do this, and we figured out he's no more than 5'6", five, 5'7". Six, five, so that really does shoot a hole, uh, so to speak, you know, through this, this long-standing belief that he was almost seven feet tall. So if there ever is to be a movie made about Ned, you know, it would be Zahn McLaren would be actually the ideal because he, he kind of looks a little bit like him. You know, he was in Longmire, um, some other shows that maybe all have seen. Actually, um, a young Charles Bronson, you know, would, would probably fit that as well. He looks, he looks an awful lot like him. So these stories about these big hulking men um, wasn't just limited to Ned. Henry Starr, um, they were saying he was about seven feet tall and then he would kill people with his giant fist. Um, but actually he was about 5'8", too. The other aspect about fake, fake news and also about you know, this ingredient about what makes a really good outlaw is that they lived in the wilderness, you know, the wilds. And it's mysterious. We don't know what's out there. You know, it's deep and it's dark and it's, it's forbidding. They lived in caves or tent cities that they can dismantle very quickly. And so they get on their horses, they run into the woods, and you don't know where they are, you know, and they just run out, you know, to kill people and go back in. So the lawmen also can negotiate these wilds as good as the outlaws. So I have seen in all of these memoirs of these lawmen that they would talk about being able to chase down these outlaws and how good they were, you know, at, at, at living out there and surviving in the woods. So portraying Ned as a man skulking around in the wilds, it satisfies two criteria, that he's a child of the forest, a noble savage, and he's most comfortable away from, quote, civilized people. And by 1892, the last tribes had been sent to reservations and <clears throat> white settlements had been established from coast to coast. The bison were almost extinct and the wilderness was quickly fading. So people were starting to get bored and they desperately needed exciting stories. And so, so creating stories about the vanishing frontier and these, these wild and crazy murderous outlaws really provided a lot of entertainment for people. They also had things to say about where he lived. They said he lived in a fortress. And this is a 4630 road in Wahilo. And so if you look up there on the left, his, he had a little fort right up there where that telephone pole is. So this is looking south and the picture on the right is looking north. So it was sitting right up there. So he did have his house made of logs, but then he set up a lookout. It was about 10 feet high and it really was, it wasn't very big. It was made of stones, but it had windows. So he could be up there on the top of that hill and he could look over the whole landscape um, to see if anybody was coming. The only, the only kink in that story is that this was at that time very heavily forested. You didn't really see for miles and miles and miles. Um, so his fortress, as they called it, was really um, basically just a place for him to go. And maybe he could 30 feet in either direction. But you would think that it would look like this, you know, in the stories. Um, so with these stories, you would think that he had some kind of grand scale castle, but that was not that was not the case at all. So exaggerations and data manipulation. So Philip Steele wrote a book about um, Zeke Proctor and Ned Christie in the early 80s. And boy, there, there were so many, you know, false statements in here. And a lot of Cherokees are very upset even by this title because the last Cherokee warriors, no, there's still a lot of Cherokee warriors that are out there today. This book, uh, written by Bonnie Spear, has been the go-to book about Ned, you know, for decades. And so this is what I did. She also wrote this, The Wolf of the Cookston Hills. So this is Bonnie's book. And so anytime, anytime I start a new project and somebody has written about it before, I go through all of their notes and I go 
right down the line and I check every single note. And this is what I found in the back of her book. She just had the dates wrong. She had the places wrong. Things didn't match. You know, she had actually just fabricated things. And so I was able to, well, literally tear this book apart realized that she was trying to fit a thesis. I mean, to her credit, she, she knew that Ned was innocent, but she was trying to force that without really doing due diligence to the source material that was there. So this is, this is when, you know, we really have to tell our students, if you are a student of history, you really have to be very careful with what you're reading. You cannot just take everything you read as truth. You really need to investigate this for yourself. The Christie is outlaw myth is a comfort story for those people who need to be emotionally reassured about their lawman heroes, that the lawmen are good, these outlaws are bad, and the good guys always triumph over the bad. So hearing this story about Ned makes people feel good. Well, it didn't make everybody feel good. Obviously, his family was still in utter distress over this. So in June of 1893, Ned's son that he had with his second wife, Peggy, he was found uh, dead on the road. He was almost decapitated. Nancy's cousin, George, was killed that same year, and his throat also was cut. So the family is becoming even more distressed over this because they're thinking that perhaps they're being targeted because of these rumors about Ned. So they had a ceremony conducted by a family medicine man to keep anybody from knowing any hundred years. And so indeed, until 1994, there were no interviews that Christie family, nobody gave interviews, there were no pictures taken at all. There were only fabricated stories told by outsiders. And nobody challenged any of those stories either until 1994. And the person who started challenging them is uh, Roy Hamilton, and he is Ned's descendant. And Roy, unfortunately, he died, the book went to press. And he was really, became such a good friend and a confidant, and I learned an awful lot from him. But in 1994, he started asking people about Ned, and people started talking about Ned again. So uh, as, as Roy liked to say it, the spell had been broken and people started researching about Ned again. But I do wanna point this out too, again, about Arch Wolf. Arch Wolf was Ned's young cousin who lived with him and Nancy. And he had left prior to Ned uh, being killed in 1892, but he really did suffer from untruths about Ned. And this is Arch on the right. You see the shackles on his ankle and this is his father. Um, on the left. His name is also Arch. So after Ned was killed, the posse went after Arch Wolf. They wanted to know where he was because they knew that he, he should have been there, but he wasn't. So to make a long story short, they arrested him. He was taken to Fort Smith and assault with intent to kill and uh, for selling liquor. So he was given um, two years of hard labor for um, assault and 32 months for um, selling booze. So apparently, you know, selling booze, you know, you're going to get a bigger, <laughs> harsher sentence for that. So he had only been there for two years. He became very despondent. He didn't speak English very well. So they sent him to the government's first hospital for the insane, later named St. Elizabeth's. And this time he, and so by this point, he's only 21 years old. So he suffers there for several years. And I say suffered because he desperately wanted to go home and they wouldn't let him go home. And what makes this story very compelling is that what happened to Ned was bad enough, but what happened to Arch was even worse. Because of these stories about Ned, people also saw Arch as being guilty. So they were not gonna turn him loose. So several years go by and they are just giving him every single day um, colocynth, which is an herb, and blue mass, which is a mercury based. And this is what they <clears throat> often gave to people who they deemed, quote, insane. But it also was a cure, supposedly, for syphilis, toothache, and parasites. The only downside is it's mercury based. But this is what they gave to a Abraham Lincoln, and is probably why he had such dramatic uh, mood swings and would be in such. Basically, what they were doing was killing him because they thought that giving you know endless uh, um, endless doses of laxatives was what insane people needed. So he was then trans transferred yet again to Canton Asylum for Insane Indians in South Dakota. And 
I've written extensively here about Arch. I have another article coming out about him, but he ended up spending the last 17 years of his life in insane asylums, and he ended up dying. And he is buried between fourth and fifth holes of the Hiawatha Golf Course. And Canton, Canton, if you know anything about it, it has been since torn down because it was really a dreadful place. Not as bad as, you know, American Horror Story, you know, that season asylum, but it's pretty pretty close to, to what they did to people there. Ned, uh, Ned's wife um, or widow, Nancy, she married his brother, Jack, and they ended up having five children. After they died, they were buried in the Jack Christie family cemetery. Well, that, that land was sold to the Thornton family and they created their cemetery. Well, then that was sold to the Nolan family. The important, the important thing here is that the Nolans, the White family bulldozed all of the Christie's the caskets, the bodies, the headstones into a lake. This wasn't really that long ago because he had a bulldozer when he did it, but they left the Thornton Cemetery. So um, Roy Hamilton, then he, he was very brave. He kind of went diving in that pond and he was able to save two of the small headstones of Nancy's, uh, one of her, two of her sons. And so he kept those in his, in his garage. So again, it's this, as time has gone by, this is what has happened to the Christie family. Um, all these dreadful things and the reputation uh, that, that, that Ned got, um, we can see how this was transferred down to today. And ultimately, I wanted to set the record straight here about Ned. And I can tell you that fans of Wild West literature are very unhappy. They did not like this book. They didn't like that I had sort of upset their story that they had been hearing for so long. And I got to hear about it. They, they wrote me and they told me, but, but that's fine. I mean, I, I really do feel like somebody had to come to his defense, but there was no proof that Christie killed Maples at all. There were other men there who had lengthy criminal records and there's always gonna be revenge. Anytime a US Marshal is killed, someone's gonna pay for it. And those who want, again, this is what Bonnie Spear did. Bonnie Spear wanted him so badly to be innocent, she engaged in bias scholarship. And I think that what that did was that sort of damaged his story. So um, you can kind of forgive her on one front because you know, she was really trying hard. But on the other hand, we really want to do this right so that nobody can, can point at it and say, oh man, so you really were wrong. Who killed Maples? Um, John Paris made himself scarce after he left um, the Little Rock Pen in 1890. He had been convicted yet again for, um, I think, assault and then whiskey selling and horse stealing or something. He just left. And I am almost absolutely positive that it was John, John Paris who killed Maples. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm gonna stop right here because uh, this goes on and on and on as to why they didn't go after Bub Trainer, but um, they, had, they had rationales for why they were gonna, they were he was innocent as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mayasua, uh, for that uh, presentation and the discussion about Ned Christie. There's certainly a lot of information to consider in that and uh, that insidious nature of fake news. So we do have some questions uh, from the audience um, that have been sent to us. And uh, we'll go ahead and we can start providing those. And, and the questions range from being kind of specific to what was covered, but also um, some more general questions. But to start out um, on this, this question comes from Jen, who's uh, one of the moderators of Ask Historians. She asks, is it your sense that Ned was treated this way by the press because of who Ned was or that they were looking for an indigenous man to villainize and any man would have done? Um, they didn't know who Ned was. You know, because a lot of these reporters, you know, across the country, you know, they were also reading stories about other tribal people, you know, keep in mind, you know, the massacre at Wounded Knee, you know, happened in 1890. And then um, there were some other events, you know, Apache Wars, you know, in the Southwest. So as far as they were concerned, you know, an Indian's an Indian, you know, so they really didn't know a whole lot of difference between them. But I will say that if they had gotten wind of the reality that Ned was educated and he could read and write English, that he was on the National Council, that would screw up their story because they would have some explaining to do, that he wasn't just this wild and crazy person. They would have to kind of rationalize, well, what happened? Why is he doing that? And then that would, that would blow a hole in their little image that they're trying to create. 
Yeah, certainly, certainly. And another question that kind of is looking into the tribe itself and, and Ned's position there, uh, this one coming from uh, one of our producers, what cultural or social factors drove the factionalization between the progressives and the nationalists within Native communities uh, during that period? Well, you know, I, I wrote a whole, <clears throat> an entire book on that, so it's very complicated, but it really comes about, it comes down to value systems because the Cherokees and the Choctaws had started intermarrying with non-natives, you know, prior to removal in the 1830s. So already you have, you know, a whole, you know, a whole group of people within these nations who are subscribing to the values of white society. They're educated, they're Christians, they are acquiring wealth, they have money. And so as time goes by, this rift just gets bigger and bigger. And within uh, the Cherokee nation, then we start seeing uh, classism and people start talking about skin color you know the women are carrying parasols because they don't want to get darker and so it's it's these values that they want to be white but yet still have the benefits of being members of the nation but I also do want to point out that within the Choctaw nation you have some of the wealthiest people are Choctaw men uh, Wilson Jones was the chief of the Choctaws um, during the time that, that my ancestor was alive. And um, uh, he was the wealthiest man, Indian or white. You know, he had thousands upon thousands of head of cattle. He had property in Texas. And so they wanted to protect that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's all of those social, economic, religious, um, yeah, all of those things that, that factor into it. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about this today, Try to talk about politics with anybody today. And that's what it was like that back then. It was extremely violent. Mm -hmm. They'd kill each other. Right, right, certainly. Uh, we, we can see the, those connections, these threads in history uh, now in our, our contemporary world. So uh, certainly. Uh, this question kind of related to that uh, coming from Devin Murray. Um, in Cherokee memory, has one particular view of Ned prevailed, the nationalist view of him as a resistor of federal oppression or the progressive view of him as a rough customer that demonstrated his guilt by not appearing to defend himself? You've got a variety of, a variety of opinions about Ned. And, but what all the people that I have talked to, the people that I know, they absolutely believe that he was a hero because Ned would get up and he would talk about tribal sovereignty. Now he wouldn't say the word sovereignty, but he was greatly concerned about what was happening, not just to Cherokees, but to the other tribes as well. And he wasn't shy about what he thought. And, you know, according to family stories, he would get up there literally on a tree stump and he would talk to anybody and everybody. And he would get up there on the balcony of one of the hotels and he would talk about what the tribe needs to do. And we need to keep these people from coming in. So many people do believe that uh, this could have been a setup. They want to get rid of him because he's such a mouthpiece. And, you know, it also is, is, you know, a reason why his political enemies didn't want to defend him. Mm -hmm. But then again, you've got some people who think, oh, yeah, he did it. Right, right. Certainly from all sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm curious, um, uh, kind of a side question from myself here. Were, was Ned's type of character being that kind of boisterous and outspoken um, common in his day? Or was he kind of a standout um, among his contemporaries? Oh, there were a lot of people speaking out. A lot of people would speak up. Now the progressives, you know, the mixed bloods, they would be the ones to really get out there and probably talk more. The full blood traditionalists tended to stay away. You know, they didn't really get out there and do that. But I think that Ned was, was confident. You know, he had a strong family. His father and his grandfather, Watt and Lacey, they both had been on the National Council as well. Um, also, um, his cousin and his brother had been on the National Council, too. So they were very well versed in, in politics. And they would sit in his father Watts' blacksmith shop and talk about politics and take a look at newspapers from around the country to see what was happening to other tribes. 
this next question uh, coming from our conference chair, Lisa, um, who was able to make part of the presentation, uh, ask, saying that uh, as a historian of ideas, uh, she's especially interested in the language used to describe people and events in the past. Were there particular words or phrases that the fake news stories used to describe Ned? Was there great variety in, in these descriptions or did they tend to center around the same concepts? It was the same concepts. And what is, what is very interesting about these stories, a lot of these stories don't even mention that he's Indian. They don't even say that he's a native person at all. So for a reader, you know, taking a look at this, it's like, oh, it's like a Billy the Kid kind of person. Mm -hmm. So right, I found certainly. that to be fascinating. Um, but then those who did say that he was a native, they would call him a savage. Of mm -hmm. course, they had to throw that in. Right, uh, of course, uh, American pastime. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next question coming from Corey. Is there any regional difference in how Ned's story was presented or was it similar narratives across the country? And uh, I'll maybe tack on to that, you know, either maybe contemporarily uh, in Ned's time or versus nowadays too. It was pretty much the same, you know, because if you had a story, like I said, coming out of Tahlequah or you know, like the Atoka Times or something, um, and then that was distributed around the country, then, you know, it's going to be pretty cons consistent across the board. But then you had people in Indian territory um, who also thought he was guilty, but there were an awful lot of white people who didn't believe that he was guilty. He had a lot of supporters. He said, I knew Ned, you know, and, you know, I'd trade with him. And um, so it, you can't really generalize. It, it's just a very complicated mesh of, of things that were going on and mm -hmm. you know you could ask somebody else and they'd say oh heck yes he you know he did it which is why I got some of the nasty little notes that I did after the book came out they didn't like that <laughs> oh man yeah I, I'm sure there's quite a few uh, who push against these narratives who receive those notes oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, another question uh, coming from myself here. You had mentioned how these types of character assassinations affected, you know, uh, other Indians uh, throughout time. But were these also really common on the local scale? Did you see, um, you know, uh, political agitators or maybe anti-Indian proponents who tried to conduct these same kind of character assassinations um, uh, on scales that weren't as big as what we see with Ned Christie? Well, no, as you were talking, I was thinking of one, uh, one thing that came out after the massacre at Wounded Knee, and it was absolutely horrifying because there was one column about Ned and then another column about the natives that were killed up there, and it was all about the bucks and the savages who got what they, you know, had coming to them and killed their little, you know, their little heathen children and all, so, so that's, that's just one example, but that, that was a newspaper in South Dakota, you know, mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, I would have to, I would have to take a look at some other articles, but oftentimes, you know, it is localized because we do know that the Apache wars in the Southwest, you know, they were very anti-Apache, mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of the stories that were coming out of there, you know, are pretty bad and those were localized too. Mm -hmm. But you got to keep in mind that people who read these stories, they're on the other side of the country and they don't know. This is how they're being educated, mm -hmm. you know, reading these entertaining stories. So it must be true. Right. Yeah. It reminds me actually of, of kind of, a, you know, from my tribe, um, the Nez Perce perspective um, around the stories about Chief Joseph. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly after the war in 1877, uh, Chief Joseph's reputation was uh, put across that national stage. And although it had more of a positive light spun to it, uh, similar things happened, right? Um, in terms of uh, making his role in the war much bigger than what it actually was or what is known to our tribe. Certainly he had a large role in it, uh, but by the end of the war, he's seen as the face of the Nez Perce tribe. He's seen as this great tactician um, taught in military schools, looking at the retreat. Um, and yet in reality, uh, Chief Joseph was actually, he was at the table, but he himself wasn't making these calls with the other headmen and chiefs um, of the different bands of the Nez Perce. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, there's uh, definitely uh, an interesting theme that happens right here where you have these stories that get blasted across the national stage and then they do change and morph over time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Another question uh, coming in from uh, Stephen Hampton, was the demonization of Ned linked to specific political issues such as the railroads or proposed allotment? 
a lot of people will argue that his family absolutely believes that it was because he was so staunchly against all of this that he was going to take the blame for this to get rid of this strong voice. Now, I didn't find any newspaper stories and Ned didn't leave behind any diaries or letters or anything. You know, he didn't talk to anybody. So a lot has to be inferred. Um, but Roy Hamilton, he, he grew up with, I think, the, the niece who knew, let's see, Ned's wife. So she was able to pass down a lot of these stories. And so um, I think Nancy was very concerned about Ned because he was so overly concerned about what was happening in his nation that something might happen to him. But on the other hand, um, again, we also have to take a look at these court records and the, the testimonies of witnesses, and they just didn't want these other guys to be convicted, and they were looking for somebody to punish. Mm -hmm. So there's that too. Right, right. Um, and then another question coming in from Jude Tanner. Uh, I was wondering how all that happened to Christy, or uh, I was wondering how all that happened to the Christie family impacted their standing in the community even now. Well, the Christie family is, you know, kind of dispersed, but I think people see, you know, people who know the Christie family, they see him as a hero. So nobody's saying to themselves, you know, oh, there they are, you know, pointing fingers or anything like that. I haven't mm -hmm. heard of, of anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you had mentioned about how the descendants of, uh, you know, the family didn't even really have a chance to voice their part of it till 1994. You know, between uh, the emergence of these narratives of Ned Christie all the way up to that point, you know, how impacted would you say they were, or maybe even, um, you know, the larger community were by these stories and these perceptions of Ned Christie? Well, you know, keep in mind that it wasn't just Ned Christie who's being written about. You know, there were other Cherokees who were being written about as well, you know, like Zeke Proctor, you know, and he, he, was, a, he was a sheriff and all these stories that were told about him were equally ridiculous. So it wasn't just all the focus on him, um, but there were so many other things that were going on in the Cherokee Nation that Ned wasn't really front and center. You know, the, the Cherokee Nation, as well as all the other nations there, they're still having to fight for, you know, treaty rights and what belongs to them and, you know, economic issues and health problems and all that kind of stuff. So focus has been, you know, distributed among a lot of different things, not just mm. just like Ned. And then another question kind of relating to, uh, you know, what we were talking about previously here and how uh, Ned did have some supporters. Um, were there any specific contemporary newspapers or mediums that described the culture and the nations realistically, or did they subscribe to these Wild West uh, type stories overall? All of the tribes had newspapers. There were, mm -hmm. there were lots and lots of newspapers in Indian Territory. So they would have everything in there from just little mundane stories about gardening, you know, to ladies corsets to this, that, and the other. But I was really primarily looking for, uh, you know, the damaging stories about Ned, but I really didn't see anything that he didn't do it. You know, he couldn't have done it. I actually didn't see anything like that. Interesting. Yeah. We, yeah. I definitely seems like a big part of this story. The newspapers of course had a, had a big sway in uh, influencing the public opinion here. So we, we got time for one more question. Um, and this one is coming from Frazier. This one's a little uh, off to the side, but um, are you able to elaborate more about the um, in Indian insane asylum? Were there different psych like psychological practices involved with native subjects at the time? Um, or are these a product of segregation? and malice and neglect oh my gosh well canton asylum for insane indians um that was really something um i you know if you're really interested in that there's several books that have just come out recently about it and i do have a chapter about arch wolf and it talks about his experiences there at canton but really it's western biomedicine you know that they they can't they're trying to find a way to categorize native people um and some of the diagnoses that came out of Canton were just the most bizarre things you've ever seen. It's almost as if they just make things up. 
And keep in mind that a lot of these people who were sent to Canton Asylum, they were sent there because they were troublemakers. Mm -hmm. If you had a native person, and this happened to a lot of women, by the way, women who were outspoken, say on some reservation and the Indian agent didn't like her because she's just being too chatty. Well, I'm just gonna, you know, we're gonna call Canton. And so a lot of women were shipped there <laughs> from mm -hmm. all kinds of reservations from across the country. And so they ended up being stuck there and very few people actually got to leave. It's like, once wow. you're there, you stayed there and you died there. And, and so yes, Canton itself is really quite the, the horror story, but it's all of these Western ways of trying to put you in a category without, without considering that, okay, well, Arch Wolf, he doesn't speak English, he's depressed. Well, maybe he's not insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, definitely. From the stories that I've heard about Canton um, and other examples of that, you know, you could be sent there for even having a physical ailment like tuberculosis. They, they uh, didn't want to deal with that. Well, Kyle, I will say this very quickly. The Cherokees had the asylum for the deaf, dumb, blind, and insane. And so they were trying to argue, let's get Arch back and put him there so he could be treated by his own people. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow that to happen. Oh, they wow. wanted to keep him at Canton. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that, it, well, thank you for elaborating more on that. That is certainly a, a part of history that uh, can use more light shed on it um, in, in these narratives and certainly how it also wraps into this story of Ned Christie. So we are at our time. Uh, we want to say thank you so much, Dr. Maisu, for being here with us today for this presentation, for answering these questions. Uh, thank you to our audience members who are able to make it for today. Uh, we do apologize again for the day switch um, uh, on, on the keynote address, but we appreciate everybody who was here who asked questions. Uh, and we encourage everybody to please head over to the subreddit on Ask Historians uh, to see the rest of the events that we have for today and our panels that will be coming out out tomorrow. And thank you all once again. Katsuyao.